This video is part of a webinar series on Hindu Dvesha, an educational series to explore and expose systemic Hindu phobia. In this webinar, we will be exploring the prevalence of Hindu Dvesha in school textbooks. Krishna Maheshwari holds bachelor's and master's degrees from Cornell University in Computer Science and Engineering and MBA from Harvard Business School. He is the founder and CEO of Hindupedia and is deeply engaged in fighting Hindu phobic narrative in school textbooks. Krishna has founded a number of Hindu organizations and is a keenly sought after speaker on the subject of Hindu Dvesha in the Western education system. So what did California look like? So, so if we look at what happened in California, there, it starts with something called the History Social Science Standards. Uh, there, that is set up through the California legislature and approved by the California governor. California has the most detailed standards of any state in the US. And it has exactly five points. So that level of detail is illustrating given that that stands above and apart everyone else. Once that is approved, and this was approved a long, long time ago, then you get into something called the California History Social Science Framework. We were engaged in the refinement of this from 2015 to 2016. Then after that in 2017 is the textbook approval process. And then there's the textbook edits and corrections phase, which, which happened from there on through 2020. In this, look at the number of bodies that were involved. The State Board of Education, the Industrial Instructional Quality Commission, the History Social Science Subcommittee of the Instructional Quality Commission. They then appointed framework authors, which were outsourced somewhat to a body called CHSSP at UC Davis. They created these IMR CRE panels. There were others behind the scenes that were involved that were never made public, even though that's illegal. Um, there were the publishers who were working in parallel. As a community, we provided public oral testimony and public written comment in thousands of letters and, and statements. At the end of it, something happened, but by and large, we'll, we'll talk about what happened, but, but think about the bureaucracy. This is government bureaucracy that's no different anywhere in the world, but it's the most bureaucratic in California because we spend the money to make it that bureaucratic, which also means to change it, we have to engage all of these bodies now, if you went to CHSSP at UC Davis in 2015, you were way too late. You should have been engaging in 2010. The framework authors did their work. And then we came in in 2015 at the History Social Science Subcommittee level, as did many others from the community. Now, in, after 2020, the process was handed over to roughly 1,100 districts who were then engaged in the process of adoption. That process is still going and will continue through next year. Now, when you look at these districts, there are 1,100 school boards in California alone. That means 1,100 superintendents of education and 1,100 subcommittees and 1,100 different processes. We have to engage in all of that for anyone that gets through this complicated process in the middle, which is at the California state board level. Now, this wasn't something we had mapped out at the beginning. We, we stumbled through this process like the rest of the community. But we did map it out towards the end to make sure that when we engage the next time, we would do so in a more systematic manner. And so when we talk about accomplishments, I want to be very, very clear. We should celebrate our wins, but we should remember that the glass isn't completely full. We didn't win. Now, we didn't lose either. And we made steps forward, but we didn't win in an absolute sense. And so if we look at California gives us a stick to wield and we used it at the framework level and at the textbook level and the stick that it uniquely gives us in this country, it's the only state that does, is that in the legislature, there is an education code and it specifically states educational materials should not stereotype adversely to reflect, demean or ridicule religious beliefs. It should also not promote religious and, oh, sorry, it should promote religious and cultural diversity, instill a sense of pride in one's religion, 
eradicate roots of prejudice, and help develop a feeling of self-worth. Great. We all thought, let's leverage this. And we did. And we'll see what happened. We went through this process at the state board level. And there were hits and misses. And the controversy that I'm sure everyone is aware of, of India versus Hinduism, happened. There were a number of meetings that happened in the front. And by and large, we lost. At that point, Kundan did submit a very, very strong letter, which I'll quote. In the framework, Hinduism is discussed between these pages and between these lines. And of them, um, they discuss the issue of caste, which basically leaves 15 lines dedicated to other issues. Um, and then they overemphasize caste, essentializing the conflation of Hinduism with caste and limiting the portrayal of Hinduism and narrowing its expanse because everything was caste-centric. In other words, frame, the framework singles out Hinduism, exposing its adherence, our kids, to ridicule and subtly portrays it to be inferior. In the contemporary world, no kid wants to be associated with such a belief. So in other words, if we're hierarchical and oppressive, you're directly impacting a kid's belief in his religion. And so Hinduism is, because it's presented as inherently hierarchical and oppressive, and is not a matter of considerable academic debate, singling it out for these negative portrayals tantama is tantamount to prejudice and discrimination. It's time for them to wake up. This is one of the largest, most important letters that were submitted. And what we know at the end of this, and we'll go into it again, was there was a significant impact behind the scenes between the final hearing with the IQC and um, on the framework and what was eventually published as the framework after the process was complete and we moved into the textbook round. She was a commissioner in the instructional uh, IQC, Instructional Quality Commission, Subcommittee on India and Hinduism. Sorry, Subcommittee on the History Social Science um, the History Social Science Subcommittee. And after a very long pause, um, and just, just a little more context, there are a bunch of commissioners, there are eight or nine in number, and it's largely an echo chamber. No one likes to raise their voice, and when they do, everyone else can, tends, tends to agree. That's just the nature of how this body works, as we saw over the last couple of years prior to this. So she takes a long pause, a deep breath in, and then she says, the only other thing I would like to bring to the committee, and this is with regards to the discussion on Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, is that I would like to cite two of the documents in public comment after reviewing public comment associated with this program. And then for document 929 9 named 9 25 by Hindupedia, this was the second one, number one, page 31 to 51 of these documents, listing 37 recommended edits and corrections. And of those, 1 through 16 and 21 to 57 are recommended. If you actually open that letter, none of those are actually edits and, and corrections because we weren't asked to submit edits and corrections. The way the process worked was we were asked to support or reject the set of materials. Now, these comments that, that she is specifically recommending all commented and asked for the rejection of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt's two programs that they had submitted. And for context, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt is the largest publisher of children's instructional materials in the U.S. And as a consequence of her standing up and being willing to support us after engagement with her over the preceding year, it resulted in everyone else saying, okay, with the exception of Bill Honig, who was the chair, who pushed back explicitly hard saying, well, what about one textbook? What about one year instead of the rest? And he tried very hard to rescue it. And it was explicit. But at the end of the day, we got agreement from the other commissioners agreeing to reject Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Now, the way this works is the subcommittee makes a recommendation. They don't actually reject anybody. That subcommittee goes to the full Instructional Quality Commission, who makes a recommendation to the state board, who then accepts that recommendation at the state board, and then it becomes official. But, but this meeting at this subcommittee was key to that rejection. Houghton Mifflin Harcourt had roughly 50% market share in California. Now, Kundan made a number of quotes from McGraw-Hill's textbooks that, approved, that were approved coming out of this process. They're egregious, as you saw. And, and so when we talk about glass half full, glass half empty, 
yes, we got the biggest publisher rejected. The second largest went through with barely a scratch and all of the key horrendous tenants in place. So what happened? In the framework, at the end, after it got approved, Kundan submitted his letter and what got published, there was a 50% reduction in the Hinduism caste hierarchy oppression discourse. The state board rejected Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Yay! Um, they not, not only got rejected in the middle school, they got rejected in K through eight in California. Two programs for eight years, only three, two of which years impact India and Hinduism until 2028 caused a 14% drop in their market capitalization. They're a public company, remember. So, so significant revenue impact, they had roughly 50% share. Um, our ongoing work outside, we work with Discovery in the process. We continued engaging with them. And I believe we played a key role in them exiting the history social sciences business altogether. So we won a couple additional market share points. Yeah. Right Now, however, the state standards aren't changed. The framework is still Hindu Dweshi. All the other textbooks are terrible. And McGraw-Hill, the second largest publisher in the US and the second largest in California, is by and large win winning the market share that Hot Mifflin Harcourt got, had to evacuate. Pearson was somewhat better. And TCI is the least bad. And guess what? The entire market is going to these three. Now, we're talking about California. But, but one thing through our engagement with publishers we learned, and we suspected beforehand, but we learned, is that they don't produce books for California. They produce books for the U.S. And those books adopt and adhere to California standards where California defines them. Similarly, in the sciences where Texas has an issue, they create books that adhere to Texas. And they put that in something that's a compendium for each of these topics. When it's in this compendium, when they go to another state, if the state doesn't have something that says, don't do this, that California requires, they get the thing that was produced in California. They don't want to produce these materials twice. And as a consequence, these books that are approved in California are making their way right now through all of the other states in the US. So we didn't stop there. Coming out of that, um, the process, because McGraw-Hill was so egregious, we produced the work Making Children Hinduphobic, a critical review of McGraw-Hill's world history textbooks. Keep in mind, these are textbooks that are approved in California for grade six and seven, which are covered in other states in grade six or grade seven or grade eight or nine or 10. We look through a large number of states' requirements. There is no social history, social science framework in any other state. Their standards are more general than those that California requires, almost as a rule. If I'm off by maybe one by a line, then that may be the case, but from everyone that we saw. In order to properly engage with these publishers, we had to create an alternate history social science framework, specifically on the chapters that relate to Hinduism and India. And we did that under the constraints that had to largely fit within the construct and the topics that California required. So where we would have wanted to introduce new topics, we refrained. It wasn't perfect, but, but we believed it would be close enough to the California framework that it would be acceptable in California, far enough away that it would no longer be Hindu Dwishi. That was signed by 11 history social science academics, six scholars in history social sciences and non-history social science academics, five academic and scholarly organizations, three sampradays, and seven social and cultural organizations. All in, those signatories represented more than one million Hindus residing in the U.S., and of course, tens of millions when you look at their global following. A lot of these numbers are driven by the three sampradays, although there is one very large social and cultural organization that signed as well. Did we get all the sampradays? No. Did it take a long time? Yes. Now, how many documents have been produced by anyone that are signed by three sampradays? In the US, I'd be challenged to push for one. Maybe there is one. But, but this endeavor took almost a year to happen between creating the document. Actually, the creating the document was the easy part, and that took six months, if I remember correctly. 
um, and the signatory process, which took nine months. So we overlapped by about three because we had reviews uh, where they got to present their feedback and, and that got incorporated to make sure we went together and move forward as a community. Krishna, you would also want to uh, tell people that um, this book is available on Amazon and the Kindle version is free. Yeah. And the other thing I will add is this, the reason we made this book available freely is because we wanted to enable others. Yeah. Right? Hindupedia's mission, by and large, is academic and educational to fix the academic system. And we were hoping people would take inspiration. And we were surprised when, when people did. This was useful in Massachusetts. I've heard that it's being used by activists in um, other states as well. They're limited in number, but we did make, make progress. So are we done? No, unfortunately. This is a long-standing effort. Since the close of the California process, we've reached out to 1,100 California school districts and realized exactly how hard it is. We've made some progress, but, but very, very limited. We met with the Indian Prime Minister's office through multiple meetings, made some progress, but, but very little. Um, I talked about the influence in several states. In the academic front, we've presented at eight conferences, made five invitational lectures, published three chapters in three different books, and one article. This work will continue to happen. Um, and so this, this is not something we're done with by any means.